Lesson number eight, 1 Timothy for beginners. Lesson eight, as I mentioned, uh, the reason for Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter three, verses 14 to 16. So in chapter one, verses three and four, uh, Paul tells us that the set purpose of the letter was to uh, encourage Timothy to maintain sound doctrine and instruct others who were doing otherwise. Part of the work of a, a minister is to teach the Bible accurately, but another important part is to correct those who may be in error or who are teaching error. With this in mind, Paul writes his letter to Timothy, which includes the following. In chapter one, verses one and two, Timothy's endorsement and authority as an evangelist. Verses three to 11, Paul uh, 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 mentions the presence of false teachers and doctrines, and of course uh, encourages uh, Timothy to correct those who are involved in this. Verses 12 to 17 of chapter one, Paul's witness of his own conversion and appointment as uh, an apostle. Uh, we go on to chapter two, verses one to seven, the need and the subject of prayer. And then in verse eight, chapter two, who and how prayer is offered. In chapter two, nine to 15, the role and the position of men and women in the church uh, in general. And then in chapter three, uh, verses one to seven, the duties and the qualification of uh, elders. In verses eight to 13, Paul goes on to talk about the duties and the qualifications of deacons and the wives of deacons uh, and by understanding the wife of elders as well. So these are the, the verses and subjects that we have covered so far in our study of uh, this book. In the last uh, section, verses 14 to 16 of uh, chapter three, Paul himself will summarize the instructions that he has thus, uh, that he has thus far uh, given to Timothy. Uh, so let's read verse uh, 14 as we get into the text that we're going to study today. It says the following, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. So we have a kind of a shift here. As Paul describes some of his present circumstances and plans to see Timothy in person to provide more in-depth teaching, more in-depth instruction. In verse 15 he says, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. So in case he's delayed, however, he says, he provides the written instructions in this letter so Timothy can handle the situation. It'd be nice if he could you know, know exactly when he would be there, but uh, he is not able to know that, so uh, he gives Timothy the instructions that he feels Timothy will need to deal with the issues at hand. He also repeats the idea that what he writes has a specific goal, and that is to instruct the members of the church on how to conduct themselves. This is the main reason for instructions on prayer, for example, or the role of men and women, or how and who to choose as elders and deacons, so that they will understand how to do things. Um, uh, Paul says that as Christians, we have a specific way to act. There's a specific way to organize the church. There's a specific way to relate to each other as members of the church. So in verse 15b, he says, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So note how he you know, refers to the church, a very exalted uh, manner. First of all, he says, it's the household of God. God is the father, we are the children. We are related because we have the same father and we dwell in his household, which is the church. He also calls it the church of the living God. The Christian church belongs to God, uh, or rather to the God that is alive, who is real. It obeys the God who actually is alive, as opposed to churches or philosophies or religions or ideologies 
that follow gods that are dead, you know, in the pagan religions, ideas that are of men in philosophy, or uh, religions that honor false gods or human traditions or man-made deities, the church of the living God. He also calls it the pillar and the support of the truth. The idea here is that uh, the main role of God's household, the living God's church, is to be the depository and the promoter of God's truth. The church preserves the truth. The church defends the truth. The church proclaims the truth. The truth that he talks about, of course, is explained more in detail in the next verse where he will refer to truth as the mystery of godliness. So let's read that, chapter 16a. He says, by common confession, and I'll stop there, by common confession is a way of saying, as the church is in the habit of saying, or perhaps as the church is in the habit of singing, or as I often say, it's a, it's a term. The idea is that Paul may be quoting a popular hymn here or a, a psalm that was said or sung by the early church which summarized the great truths contained in the gospel message. So by common confession, you know, as people are saying, as we are you know, usually saying, great is the mystery of godliness. Now at first he says truth, now he refers to this truth that the church is to preserve and proclaim as the mystery of godliness, same thing. He's referring to the same thing using two different, uh, two different uh, terms. And of course, the gospel is the truth. The gospel is that mystery that he's talking about. Truth in that the gospel explains who the true God is. The gospel explains what man's true condition is. It also explains how God has saved man from condemnation. It also gives us insight as to what happens after death and more importantly, who God has sent as the true savior. So there's the truth, that's the truth, the reality, in the sense that uh, the gospel contains uh, exactly what God uh, thinks and does and has done, uh, has done rather on our behalf. Then he talks about the mystery, you know, he calls it the mystery of godliness. This truth about God and man's condition and salvation and the future was not known until it was revealed by Jesus Christ. That's why he calls it a mystery. It's not a mystery to us now, but it was a mystery. How is God going to save man? Who is the Messiah? When will he come? And when he comes, what will he do? All of this was a mystery. In 16c, he writes, he who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. So you note there's a different way to print that in some of your Bibles. You probably see that there's ordinary printing. Then all of a sudden this here changes because it's a poem or a hymn or a, or a song. So here Paul either recites the hymn or summarizes the content of the hymn that was circulating. Either way, he lists for Timothy the main points in the hymn which list the major ideas and teachings of the gospel itself. The truth or the mystery of godliness, he says, can be summarized in the following way. First of all, it was revealed in the flesh. Well, the incarnation, right? We believe that God became man in the form of Jesus of Nazareth. John talks about this in John, the Gospel of John, chapter one. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then a little further down in verse 14 he writes, and the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, here he's talking about, he's talking about Jesus. 
This is the first and foremost teaching of the gospel and the thing that all confess as they're baptized into Christ. Every single person from Pentecost until today, at the moment of their baptism, what is it that we ask them? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And so this was a basic idea from the very beginning, encapsulated uh, in a poem or, or a hymn that was uh, circulating at, at the time. Then he says, <clears throat> it was vindicated in the spirit. And of course, vindicated in the spirit is referring to the resurrection, right? Romans chapter one, verse four, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. So when Paul is talking about the vindication or when we're talking about the vindication, another word for vindication, confirmation. The resurrection is the confirmation that Jesus was indeed the Son of God, that He was telling the truth. How do we know that? Because He resurrected from the dead. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, Paul says that Jesus' resurrection was powered by the Holy Spirit. And so to all who doubt or disbelieve or deny that Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit responds with the resurrection of Jesus to prove or to vindicate that every claim that Jesus made was indeed true. He made many claims about what was to take place and who he was and so on and so forth. Had he not resurrected from the dead, there would be no vindication, there would be no confirmation. But his resurrection from the dead confirms as true everything that he said and everything that he taught and everything that he commanded us also has been confirmed as being from God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then he says, beheld by angels, so there's the spiritual witness. Not only was Jesus' resurrection witnessed by hundreds of people here on earth, it was also witnessed by those in the spiritual realm as well. I go to John chapter 20, verse 11 here. Uh, in the story of the resurrection, John writes, but Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping, and so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. Of course, this is the tomb where Jesus was buried. And uh, she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head uh, and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. The idea here is that these angels were there to testify that even angels were aware of the resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ. This means that even Satan, who is created as an angelic being, was and is aware of Jesus' resurrection as well as the angels in heaven. So all of creation and all of the spirit world have witnessed the resurrection of Christ. Another verse, he says, was, uh, there was a proclamation among the nations. You know, beginning at Jerusalem, proclamation to preach. Beginning at Jerusalem until the end of the world, the truth about Jesus will be preached to all men. That's what Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, verses four to six. Jesus gave this instruction to his, uh, his apostles after his resurrection, and many years later, Paul says that this instruction was carried out. Let's read uh, the initial instruction, Matthew 28. And Jesus, and this is after his resurrection, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, and he was speaking to his apostles, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Why do we know that that's true, that all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth? Well, he's been resurrected from the dead. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so uh, the gospel, according to Jesus' command, uh, was preached. The command was given and, and the proclamation was made. And Paul, during his uh, ministry time, says that the gospel has reached everywhere in the, in the world at that time. Um, another uh, part, uh, the mystery of godliness, it was believed on in the world. 
As I say, beginning at Pentecost, where 3,000 people were baptized, we see that the truth has gained believers. You know, believed on in the world. Uh, I go to Acts chapter 2, verse 40 and 41. This is Peter preaching the first gospel sermon, the first proclamation of this resurrection. And uh, near the end of his uh, uh, sermon, Luke uh, says, and with many other words, he, Peter, solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word, meaning they believed it, were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. And so I, I use this scripture as one example, there are many, uh, of course, in the New Testament, one example to demonstrate that the gospel was actually proclaimed to people and people actually believed it and responded to it in repentance and baptism. And so that's what that, you know, the little poem that he's, he's uh, reciting there, it says, he was believed on in the world. Well, yes, he was. Here's an example of that believing taking place in Acts chapter two. Another part, it says, he was taken up in glory. Well, taken up in glory is what? Well, it's the ascension, is it not? The ascension of Jesus into heaven in Acts chapter one, verse nine. It says, and after he had said these things, meaning Jesus speaking to his uh, apostles, and after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. So after completing his preaching, his death on the cross, his resurrection, the final instructions to his apostles, Jesus is visibly taken into heaven. And this, of course, is an actual preview of what our own transformation will be like after we are resurrected from the dead. You know, we, we often see the, the exhortations and the encouragements, if you wish, to be like Christ and to do, what would Jesus do? You know, we, 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 we concentrate, uh, and so we should, uh, we concentrate on, on uh, Jesus' teachings uh, to implement them in our own lives, into our own character, into our own uh, behavior, if you wish. And we focus on that while we live. What would Jesus do? How can I grow as a Christian? What can I do to please the Lord? What can I do to serve the Lord? And that's, that's fine, that's well and good. Much of the information in the New Testament uh, uh, deals with conduct. You know, what are we to think and what are we to say and what are we to do to, to be in line with, with what Jesus taught? Uh, his uh, disciples. But the New Testament also talks about uh, what will happen to us as we leave this world and when we are resurrected. It also gives us not as much information, mind you, as we have about what our life on earth is supposed to be like as Christians, but enough to know that there's a transformation coming. I mean, yes, we die, yes, but you know, as this small poem is talking about, uh, there's something else that happens. He resurrected, that means he has the power to make us resurrect. And when we resurrect, just as his body was transformed, our body will be transformed. Just as his transformed body was you know, uh, ascended into heaven, our transformed body will be in heaven. Just as his glorified body uh, 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 was different when it appeared you know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, our glorified bodies will be changed uh, to be like his. Jesus even says that we'll be like the angels. So we don't only have information about how we ought to live here and, and, and the, the transformation of our character and of our lives here on earth but we also have some information about the transformation of our, not only our character, but the transformation of our being that will take place uh, when we are resurrected and when we ascend with God, to be with God in heaven. So let's, you know, let's, let's remember to, 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 to stay focused on, 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 on that part uh, of, uh, of the Christian life the resurrection and, and, and the ascension into heaven. You know, Paul tells us in Philippians, you know, he, he keeps his eyes forward, focused in the future. And we, we should also keep our eyes focused on the future because there's something good that's waiting for us uh, in the future. So in the uh, first three uh, chapters, 
uh, what is Paul saying? Or what is he trying to teach Timothy? So I just want us to summarize here. Well, first of all, there's a specific order and organization that needs to be followed in the church. A lot of the things that happen in a lot of churches nowadays, you have uh, women who are uh, uh, bishops, uh, pastors, you have uh, uh, churches that are, uh, you know, one man is responsible for five churches, you, know, you have different things like that uh, uh, that are not based on the New Testament. And so Paul teaches Timothy that there's a way to organize the New Testament church. There's the way that it should function. The leaders and those who serve uh, have certain responsibilities and roles. And as far as I understand, nothing has changed. The New Testament has not changed. We still have the same New Testament. We still have the same instructions on how to organize a, a New Testament church. So it was a purpose that he had to teach Timothy, but beyond that, his purpose is also to teach us today. Uh, secondly, leaders in God's church need to be qualified before being appointed to leadership roles. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you'll, you'll see that in, a, in, a, in a, any business training book that has nothing to do with you know, spiritual things, of course. We want to get the best people and we want them to be qualified in certain ways before we appoint them to you know, management jobs or supervisory roles. Well, it's the same thing in the church. Number three, uh, members of the church need to conduct themselves according to God's will and not the world. You know, this is the basic idea he was trying to get across to Timothy here. We have to continually, even to this day, encourage the church and, and remind the church that we are not of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Very important idea. And number four, the role of the church and its main duty is to preserve the teaching of Christ and to proclaim the gospel to the world. Our responsibility here, for example, in this congregation, sure, we, we want to pass on you know, the physical building uh, the generation that came before us, they're the ones that broke ground and they, you know, they practically built this building themselves. And the next generation added to it and fixed it and then the following generation did more and expanded it and so on and so forth. And the present generation, we look around at the young people in our youth group and the small children, we want to bequeath to them uh, you know, this, this property and this building so that they can continue to do the work of the Lord in this community. That's good, that's, that's okay. But that's not our primary responsibility to the next generation. The primary responsibility we have to the next generation is that we maintain the teaching of the Bible and we teach them to maintain proper teaching as well in their generation. That's the spiritual responsibility that we have uh, to, the next, uh, to the next generation. We need to preserve the teachings, not, not, not go past the teaching, not neglect teaching, not change any of the teaching, to pass it on as it was given to as it was given to us, and to encourage them to always seek to make sure that they are uh, not only teaching, but living according to God's word and not man's ideas. So note that a, a majority of the problems in the Christian world are a direct result of violating these simple principles. For example, <clears throat> Many have abandoned the organizational model of the church in the Bible and they've substituted their own model. And what has that done? Well, that's caused all kinds of problems and divisions. All kinds of hybrid church-like models that we see in the world today. I mentioned briefly one man in charge of two congregations or three. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the hierarchy that exists, for example, in the Catholic Church is unheard of in, in the scriptures. That one man be at the very top and then you know, a group of men respond to him and then another group of men respond to them and they're in charge of territory. That, that's, that's a man-made structure, that's not that's not a biblical structure. 
Um, uh, religious leaders, for example, are chosen for their education or their length of service or their popularity or reasons other than the list of qualifications given by Paul. In our day and age, even practicing homosexuals can serve as uh, bishops in some uh, religious groups. Uh, and what has that done? Well, brought in all kinds of religious error. I mean, if you can do that, you can do pretty much anything with the, with the scriptures, and you can only do that. You can only do that by denying the inspiration of certain passages in the Bible. That's the only way you can get there, to have that type of situation, by denying that Paul is not speaking in an inspired way about who can serve and who cannot serve what is sin and what is not sin. There's a great movement in our society, even in, uh, even in the, the, the church, that we should be uh, more uh, open and uh, accommodating to people who have uh, uh, same-sex issues, homosexuals, uh, you know, lesbians, uh, transgender, anyways, the whole, the whole gamut of uh, what I refer to as sexual dysfunction because we were created man and woman. He created male and female, all right? We go back to that idea. And I understand what, what some you know, teachers are saying. We need to be open. We need to, you know, it's the old story, hate the sin, love the sinner, absolutely. We can't reject a man uh, simply because he struggles with same-sex uh, issues and feelings that individual you know, is loved by God. And therefore that individual needs to be loved by us. He needs to be taught the same things we are taught about the gospel and about conduct and so on and so forth. But the Bible also teaches something about repentance as well. And it doesn't accept that particular lifestyle as acceptable before God. Is that a difficult thing? Absolutely. Absolutely that's a difficult thing, but we don't resolve it <laughs> by simply accepting it. That's not the way that the Bible uh, teaches us to resolve issues uh, that are contrary to the teaching in the New Testament. Uh, another example, um, church members who refuse to let go their worldly and sinful attitudes when they're converted or they go back to them after a while instead of maturing spiritually. That's why so many churches are weak, not powerful in the spirit. You have churches that have nice worship services and they have professional musicians playing and they, you know, it's all nice and it's, it's well choreographed and uh, stagecraft is, is wonderful and that's all good. But this is not how we measure the spirituality of something. This is not how we measure the acceptability of something or someone before God. God accepts those who obey his word. <laughs> he doesn't look at buildings or flash or, 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 or things that are you know, very professional. You know, he's not looking at that. He's looking at, are you faithful? He's looking at, are you obedient to my word? He's looking at, are you pure? That's what he's looking at. So worldly Christians make for weak churches. And of course, uh, churches get busy doing social programs or benevolent works or youth activities, building programs, and they neglect the teaching of God's word and proclamation of the gospel. I'm not saying that social programs are not important. Sure, you know, food program, clothing for the poor, you know, all kinds of good works done to alleviate the suffering of the people, not only in the church, but of the people in the community, of course. But what happens many times is that the church becomes a social service center and it forgets that its original mandate is to proclaim the gospel. These other good works are supposed to be done in order to give credibility to what they are saying. I believe that you people are sincere in your proclamation of the gospel because I see all the good works that you do. But all the good works that you do without preaching of the gospel does not benefit the community in the long run. 
You might feed some bellies and you know, clothe some people and make their lives a bit more comfortable and, and, and a bit easier. But if you haven't proclaimed the gospel to them, uh, you, have not, uh, you, know, you have not done what God has asked you to do um, uh, for people, and that is bring them face to face with the gospel of Jesus Christ, very important. Again, I'm not saying to neglect the one, but we need to do both things, very important. So these type of churches have worldly success as organizations, but they're very immature and dry spiritually. And they ultimately, because of this, they become unfruitful spiritually. In the end, Jesus said, you know, when the Son of Man comes, what does He say? Will He find what? Yeah, will He find faith, belief in Him? That's the number one thing. When I do seminars you know, on church growth and uh, for, for smaller congregations that, you know, and, and some medium and large size, you know, every church, no matter what size it is, wants to grow. I tell them, when the Lord comes, He's not looking for big churches, He's looking for faithful ones. So if you're a church of 15 people and you're faithful, yeah, Jesus is looking for you. If you're a church of 3,000 people but you're not faithful to the gospel or if you've twisted His word or you've gone beyond His word or you've denied His word, it doesn't matter if you've got 10,000 people. If you're not faithful, you will not be acceptable to Him. And the role of the preacher, and, and I'll you know, get back to Timothy here, the role of the preacher Timothy was a preacher, was to make sure that the church always has those priorities in order. Very important. Okay, so there's uh, lesson number eight. Not a lot of passages, but I, I, I wanted to kind of regroup us a little bit and, and, and summarize what we've done so far uh, so that we can continue on to finish out this, uh, this epistle. Okay, that's it for now. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much for your attention.